Hello. This is the electrical mechanical energy conversion class. The lecture for electrostatic device. Today, I would like to introduce you some basic concepts of electrostatic energy conversion. We will start from the basic theory and principle. Later, I will introduce you to some design cases. Okay, first, let's start by the concept of electrostatic energy conversion. In this figure, you will see we have a charge Q versus voltage V figure. For an electrostatic energy conversion mechanism, usually we can consider a capacitor. The capacitor has charge Q, potential difference V, and uh, capacitance C. The relation between these two three quantities are Q equal to C multiplied by V. So we have two mechanisms. One is charge constraint mechanism. The second one is voltage constraint mechanism. For this figure, for charge constraint mechanism, we have this curve from A, B, B back to A. So point A is the starting point. Then we go to point B, reach the constraint charge. Then we follow this horizontal line to B. Then go back to original point A. So this is a cycle for the charge constraint, electrostatic energy harvesting. In this VB section, the charge is constant Q0. For a cycle from A, B, B back to A, the energy deposited or in the capacitor is the gray area, A, B, B. So this is the energy we store in the capacitor. For another case, voltage constraint case, the curve goes from A to C, back to D, and back to A. So this is the cycle for voltage constraint case. In this loop, from point C to point B, we have the voltage constant. Then the energy set in the capacitor is the triangle area A, C, B, back to A. Apparently, the energy saved in the capacitor is different for these two cases. The voltage constraint case has a large area compared to the area of, for the case of the charge constraint case. Then the energy saved by the voltage constraint case is much larger. So apparently it's better to select the voltage constraint case. But in reality, in order to have the voltage constraint here, we need to supply energy to keep the capacitor in this constraint voltage case. So, you know, there's a trade-off, and it's not easy to do. So usually, we go for the constraint charge case. 
So now let's back to the equation case. Then for the voltage constraint case, the energy set in the capacitor can be expressed by this equation. And the energy set by the charge constraint mode can be expressed by this equation. So you could go to the simple algebra to obtain these two expressions. Here I will divide the equation for you. Okay, for the voltage constraint case, we want to calculate the surface area of the triangle ACD. So we can think we can use this this large area minus this small triangle area ABE. So first we can calculate the large area. So it could be So we want to express by C max max, C minima, and B max, or B max and B start. So we start here, and B max here. Then C max is the slope of the line AC. C minimum is the slope of line AB. So the slope C is the capacitance, because Q equal to CB, so for this figure Q, V, Q in the Y coordinate, V in the X coordinate. So C could be the slope of this straight line. Okay, so in terms of V max, V star, C max now, and C null, we want to write down these two equations. Okay, so first we could uh, so this is C maxima, uh, B maxima. So for this large triangle, B maxima times the height. The height is B maxima times the slope. B maxima times the slope. And divided by two is the triangle area A, C, E then minus the triangle area of this small triangle A, B, E which is B max times the height is B max times multiplied by C minimum divided by 2. Okay, then we can move the perimeter 1 half out. Then we have C maximum stay inside. Then C minimum stay inside. Then we have B maximum, B maximum square. Okay, so this is the equation of the first one. For the second one, we can use this trapezoidal area. So the trapezoidal area, or we can use another triangle formula, the button times the height times divided by 2. So this line length B D is B max minus B star. B max minus B star. And the height is B star.
Please start. Time is so slow. See maximum. So this is the height that the body by two. So we need to convert this one into this one. So we can say this one equal one over two. So C X one and V X Actually, we have the first C max now. B max B start. So for the second one, the C middle equal to the so root C middle B max B start. So C max. C max V start times C max equal to V start uh, V max times C middle so we could keep V we can change P, this equation into V start because V start times C maximum equal to V max times C minimum because this is VE. So we could uh, move 1 over 2 outside, then C maximum, C minimum inside, and V max, V star, V max, V star outside. So, yes, we get these two equations. These are the two uh, basic equations for electrostatic energy conversion. And you can see the sign. This is a capacitor, but the capac capacitance could be varied of a reactor, actually. Okay, let's go to next page. See, the drawback of the voltage constraint case is from the process C to D, we need additional source to keep the voltage fixed at its value, so, which is troublesome. So this is the description for the charge constraint case. Okay, the charge Q0, this is Q0, the constant charge. It can be calculated by C minimum. This is low times the value V max. So V max times C minimum. is the height here, which is the value of Q0. So in this case, we for this director, we have the competitance change from C maximum to C minimum. Okay. So this is the advantage for the 
child can train kids because we only need a charge source to begin the process. We can depart the charge to the capacitor and keep the charge constant. Then and because the slope the say the V maximum times C minimum is the charge value because C minimum is a small value compared to the voltage V maximum. So the charge value can be much less than the V max. Okay, so we have a figure to explain what the device looks like. Um, on your right hand side, we have a figure. So this is a device to convert electrostatic energy into the electricity. So we have two modes of operation. Let's look at mode one. The dark area, they are fixed. Uh, they won't move. You could think uh, this is a micro device um, fabricated on a wafer. And this dark area are structures attached to the wafer. And they are fixed. They cannot move. And the gray area are structures. They, they are connected to the gray area, the fixed part. Then they can move. In this case, see, this gray mass can move up and down, up and down. And this gray mass are suspended to the wafer through these two anchors. And uh, due to the structure design, the gray mass is not easy to move in this horizontal direction. See, they have the two anchors to make the movement in this direction difficult, but uh, the movement in this direction much easier. So this is one mode of operation. And the second mode of operation looks like this. Then the dark area are fixed. The gray area are free to move, but uh, they are connected to two anchors. So it's easy to move in this direction and uh, not easy to move in this direction. And here we have the top V and this one is the side view of the device. For the side view of the device, see, uh, this is the anchor. So anchor, anchor, fixed to the wafer. And this is the floating part. And two screens connected this uh, moving part to the anchors. Then, see, if we can depart the charge on the device, so say we have charge, positive charge, on these tiny structures, then due to charge neutrality, we can have negative charge on the anchors, and positive charge, negative charge, we, we enlarge this area we have okay. and this is gray gray this is dark so we have say positive charge q positive charge q and here we have minus charge who keep due to uh, charge neutrality so positive negative we have a uh, 
capacitor, positive charge, negative charge. We have another capacitor. So we have two capacitors here. If this great mass is moving up and down, so see, they will move down or they move up. Then for a capacitor, the capacitance equal to permittivity multiplied by overlap area divided by the gap. So the gap is the distance between the electrode. And the overlap area is the, the area facing each other on these two electrodes. Epsilon is the electrical permittivity of the medium before the, between the electrode, also named by di, di electric constant. Then, if the moving part moving up and down, then A will be varied. If A is varied, then we have C is varied. Say C can change from C maximum to C minimum. And the mechanism for this one, the same. If you zoom in this area, we have two dark and one gray B. And we have, say, positive charge Q and negative charge Q over 2. Q over 2. So we have two capacitors here. And if the gray mass move left and right, then all the overlap area are constant, but the gap between these two electrodes is, say, decrease, increase, decrease, increase. Then the gap if we very get the C will be varied from C maximum to C minimum. And for this device, um, you could think the overlap area between this electrode and this electrode are uh, constant for the gap between them can be varied due to the motion of this moving part up and down. Then we can have the capacitance varied from C maximum to C minimum. So for this one, it's an uh, implant overlap. If the substrate, the surface, this is the wafer surface, then this moving part also move relative to the surface area of the substrate, the wafer, they move in the plane. The plane of the movement of the gray mass is parallel to the surface, the wafer surface. So they share the same, although they are not in the same plane, but the, the two planes are parallel to each other. We call this in plane overlap. And for this one, the gray area also move on the wafer surface. Then, but uh, the gap is closing open, closing open. So we call this in plane gap closing. And for this one, the wafer surface is, say, horizontal surface. And the movement direction of this moving mass is perpendicular to the wafer surface. So we call this one out of plane get closing. So basically we have three types of micro device for the it is called static energy conversion.
Okay, next one. If we compare the three types, so we have advantage and disadvantage of these three types, then the other plant get clothing, we may have a surface of a huge problem because, see, the top mass may attach to the bottom surface and they will adhere to each other. And also the damping, because usually if we start in a vacuum environment, we have air between the electrodes. So if the electrodes close open, close open, we have air to create damping to dissipate energy. So from the same point of energy conversion, we prefer the energy can be converted from say mechanical to electric e e electrical energy. We try to avoid the energy dissipation by the damping. Then for this type, how the plane get closing type, we have capacitance change a lot. So which is a good thing for energy conversion. We prefer the value V max V C maximum minus C minimum to be large to increase our energy conversion efficiency. Okay, but for in plan gap closing, so in order to prevent the two electrodes to uh, uh, to contact each other. We need to have the mechanical stop to do it. And again, mechanical damping is also an issue for get for the implant get closing. See the get closing. So the air here also will create the mechanical damping. And for the implant overlap type, say, implant overlap type. Usually, we don't need to worry about the, the two electrodes to contact with each other. And, but uh, the capacitance change uh, is smaller compared to the gap closing case. So C maximum minus C minimum is relatively small. But uh, because usually we don't need to worry the two electrodes contact each other, so we don't need the mechanical stopper. And the Q factor, for high damping, we have low Q factor. For low damping, we have high Q factor. So Q factor is a uh, major of the damping effect. So we prefer high Q factor, which is low density. Okay, now we have a real case of the electrostatic energy harvesting. So in this figure, we have the fixed electrode at the top fixed natural at the bottom, then we have the moving mass. They are connected to another two electrodes. The four beads suspend the moving mass. Then the transducer here is for energy conversion. We call the energy converter transducer to convert energy from one domain to another domain. See, the transducer one, the, these transducers, transducer two, these transducers. It could be um, the material could be silicon, a semiconductor. Then silicon are not good for the electrode or wire to come into contact to, to be the pair.
head for the, to communicate or to deliver the signal. So we have the pad for connection. It could be gold or other material with high conductivity. And the four springs here, they, they are nonlinear springs, means they can create the bandwidth of the device to convert the energy. See, the, the vibration energy, um, usually it is multimodal, means it won't vibrate at a single frequency. It could be, it could have different components, it could have different frequency components of the vibration source. So in order to um, convert the, the vibration energy with a lot of frequency components, we prefer the energy converter to have a large bandwidth to do that. So for the four suspension beads, um, we say we can test the beads. Uh, see, we apply a force to so see one end fixed, and the other end we can apply a force. Then we can record the force in a y coordinate and record the displacement in the x covenant. So if we say ground zero, we increase the displacement, then the, re the free force increase. Like this. So it's not a straight line. This is a straight line. It's not a straight line. It's a curved line. So see, as the displacement goes larger, the reaction force increases much larger. So we could say it's getting harder and harder to move the screen. So we call this hardening effect. For this hardening effect, it can increase the bandwidth of the device. Another type of the screen, if you say, if the force is the curve look like this, we increase the displacement, and the reaction force is decreasing. I mean, also, the absolute value is increasing, but the increment it becomes increment is smaller. So it becomes softer and softer. So at the beginning, to in from zero to 20 micro, we may require an increase increment, the increase in force, like say 0 0.01 Newton. But from at this range, we increase the displacement 20 micro, and the increase in the spring force it may only say 0 0.005 Newton. So it becomes easier to deform the beam. So this type of spring with the spring force and this one follow this type of curve is softening. For softening spring also we have we can have large bandwidths. See, in this subling curve, 
The summary part is this part. The, the summary part is this part. And the hardly part is this part. So the, it gets harder and harder to move the spring. In, in this direction, minus x direction, it gets easier to move the spring. Let's say in this range, minus 60 to 60. So in this range, it's harder and harder to move the spring. But in this direction, it gets easier and easier to move the spring in this range. So we have hardening spring behavior and softening spring behavior. Then for this device, say, if we move the positive acceleration, it gets harder and harder to move it. If we move in this negative acceleration, it gets easier and, and easier to move it. So we have the hardening behavior in positive acceleration. We have a softening behavior in the next acceleration. And this asymmetric design is due to the structure of the beam. See, if we move this, this way, we compress the beam. So it's not easy to keep compressing the beam. But if we move in this direction, we elongate the beam. It's relatively easy to elongate the beam. So we have this asymmetric material behavior for this device. Then, before we can make use of this device, we need to deposit charge to the B. And one way to do it is to use the corona charging. We apply very high voltage, and uh, we have the PD thing on top of the plate, then we have agreed a net to distribute the electric field. Then this way, we could deposit charge to the device. We call these charges electric. So we could use polar polymer field. So this is polar polymer field. Then due to this charging process, we can polarize the charge. Say the charge, we have many polar. Then we could uh, polarize, then see, they barely, almost on the end, the arrow head it, uh, pointed to the top, and the tail pointed to the bottom. So we could cre create some charge at the top and some charge at the bottom. We call this polar molecule here, each one. Then um, say for this, we, we have the, either we use charge electric or we create a potential a bias. But uh, this way, it's not good because for energy, um, in the standpoint of energy harvesting, we prefer, we don't need the, uh, uh, the external energy supply to convert energy. We prefer to use the electric to convert the energy automatically. To fabricate the device, to fabricate the device, we can use the microfabrication. See, 
for this we can depart this aluminum at the top the four aluminum for pad and button aluminum for the fabrication purpose and B we can use the prisma to edge the top surface to create this mechanical structure then after that we could use a glass to as the handle wafer as the bottom wafer Then we have a figure for the photo for the fabricate device. And for microfabrication purpose, we have some protection structure here to protect these tiny beans. Otherwise, during the etching process, they can be etched by the agent. And also in this section, for the asymmetric screen, we have some protection structure to protect the tiny bit. Because we have a large opening here, means when we do aging, this portion may be aged a lot compared to the other part. So it's better we have the protection structure to protect the screen. Okay, then we carry out the experiment. This is the setup for our experiment. The energy conversion device here. We use a package and wire bonding to connect the pad to the outside world. And here is the PCB board. Then the signal wire. So we have two load resistors soldered to the PCB board. So we have the DAQ board to measure the output and we have a vibration exciter, a shaker to provide the mechanical energy then here is the frequency response of the, this electrostatic energy conversion device so the X coordinate represent the frequency. The Y coordinate represent the output voltage. Then if we say we increase the shaker frequency, then see the displacement or the voltage output of the electrostatic energy harvester say increase then decrease if we go increase the frequency this way if we decrease the frequency of the shaker from high to low it will follow with this one it goes back follow the dash line is the down sweep the side line represent the up sweep so the up sweep and down sweep follow different paths. So this is an electro the characteristics of this asymmetric spring behavior. So 
you could think if this is the threshold. So if the voltage output, this we can take for this one, the peak value here, if the dual point 707 multiplied the peak voltage as the threshold of the bandwidth, then this value, say dual point 707 multiplied the peak value. So the bandwidth could be this large from 520 hertz to say 582 hertz. So we increase the bandwidth a lot. And in this device, we could uh, consider the gravity. The gravity may play a role in this device. The mass may be attracted by gravity and the gravity will influence our testing result. Uh, we have say, we have two transducers for our device. Transducer one, see at the top, and transducer two at the bottom. So the frequency response of these two transducers. For the shaker, we can use harmonic frequency input, but uh, in reality, the vibration source could be rendered. So, say this is the white noise. We have different level of the white noise, and they spread out. They have almost all frequency components. So this is the broadband random vibrations and we test the device. You also use that uh, white noise. Also, we create a model to simulate this uh, energy conversion device. Uh, so we continue for this lamp model. We use this model to simulate the system behavior. The shuttle mass is the rectangle with mass M. It can move up and down. We have a nonlinear stream represented by this symbol and mechanical damping V and transducer 1, capacitance C1 of X. Transducer 2, capacitance C2 of X, means they are functions of the displacement X of the mass M. The overlap length for transducer 1 is X01. The overlap length for transdu trans transducer 2 is X02. And X represent the displacement of the shuttle mass M. For any um, capacitors on a device, because we have a lot of electrodes, a lot of charges of different potentials, so we may have parasitic capacitance in the device. So we use CP1 to simulate one parasitic capacitance and CP2 to simulate another parasitic capacitance. And in this device, they use the voltage source to bias the mass M. They didn't use electric 
in this case, we have two load resistors R L one and R L two. And for each load resistors, we have capacitance, positive capacitance parallel to R L two, and positive capacitance of L two C P L two. Okay, this is our lamp model. As long as we have external vibration, we can use this lamp model to simulate our system behavior. Okay, here is the equations for the lamp model. Um, we have the mechanical model, mx double dot plus bx dot plus the spring constant, we use a polynomial, seventh order polynomial, to model the spring behavior. We have k1, k2, k3, k4, k5, k6, k7. We have three parameters. And we have this electrostatic force, Fe. And this is the external vibration. And for the electrostatic force, Fe, Fe could be derived using the potential, the electrostatic energy, U equal to 1 over 2 Cv squared. And electrostatic force is partial U, partial X. Then because Q equal to Cv, then we can use these two equations to derive this one, U equal to Q squared divided by 2C. Then, Fe equal to partial U partial X. So we use this because Q is constant in our case. Then we have this expression by differentiation. Okay, so because we have two capacitors, so we have two expressions, two terms for Fe. Then C1x is, uh, because we have a periodic capacitance parallel to, we have C1 of x and Cp1. So the total capacitance C1 equal to Cp1 plus the C capacitance C1 of x. Uh, we use the parallel assumption simul uh, simplification to calculate the capacitance is permittivity times the overlap length then times the thickness of the electrode divided by the gap D. So we can do some manipulation. We can get this final solution. CO1 is the initial capacitance of C1, the initial value, when x is zero. And C2 of x is Cp2 plus epsilon L, XO2 plus x divided by D. So we also we can manipulate this equation to reach this one. And after that, we can, because we have C1 of x, C2 of x, we can use this equation to calculate Fe due to C1 and due to C2. Then we can express them this way. Okay, so here is the mechanical part for the circuit part. T1 dot is the current, you can think current goes in, we can use KCL. Current goes in equal to current goes out. And the current goes out, we have, say, VL1 is the potential difference of the load resistor I1. So the current goes out equal to VL1 divided by I1 plus CL1 times dv L1 dt. The current goes through the capacitor. Also, VL1, say VL1 is the potential difference across load resistor L1. 
So VE is the supply voltage, and VE VL one equal to VE minus the potential difference across the capacitor is Q one divided by C one X. So we can combine these two to form this equation. Also for Q two, the current goes through another branch. We can have a similar equation. So we have the mechanical one and the electrical ones. We can turn this equation into the state equation form. Okay, so here is the electrical, electrical mechanical modeling of this electrostatic energy conversion device. The initial capacitance can be calculated using the parallel capacitor assumption of the initial state of the two capacitors. And the mass of the proof mass M, we, we use the dimensions of the device to calculate the mass. Because the spring behavior is highly nonlinear, hardening, and softening, then we use a seventh order polynomial to fit this. FD curve. Then, using the white uh, vibration signal, white vibration means the frequency components is across the spectrum. Then we have some level, the low level broadband random vibrations. We can use our model to calculate the frequency response of the device. At no uh, input level, the system behaves like a linear case, and the recent frequency is near 590 hertz. When the vibration level increases, we could see Gradually, we have the, we can see the spring softening behavior. The frequency response is broadened and towards the low frequency level, the low frequency range. Then see the bandwidth increase step by step until for the highest uh, vibration level the bandwidth can be taken from 520 hertz to 580 hertz. So the bandwidth is increased a lot due to this nonlinear spring behavior for this electrostatic energy conversion device. Uh, here is the figure for output power versus the acceleration level for trans transducer 1 and transducer 2. High acceleration, high output power. And for this um, output power versus the acceleration level, um, we have the testing result follow the dashed red line. But we want to test the comparison between this nonlinear case with the linear case. So if the system is a linear case, the result could follow the solid black line. So at this level, it could be 90.4 nanowatt power output. But for our device, the output power reaches 152 nanowatt. Then 
we have a large increase of the output power. So the increase is 68 percentage for the power output increase. Then, um, see, the orientation of the device could be different, see, due to the installation of the device to our target vibration source. We want to test the gravity effect to the performance of the device with different orientations. So figure A, we have the vertical direction, and B is a horizontal direction, and C is inverted vertical direction. Different orientations of the device, and we have the result. See, the resistance, the peak, shifted somewhat due to the gravity. And also, the frequency response is influenced by the gravity. Then, this figure, we have the experimental result and uh, the simulation result. We use the mechanical damping per parameter B and uh, the spring constant K1 to K7 as the fitting parameter, we adjust the parameters to fit the simulation to the experiment. So for this, um, the output voltage versus the input frequency, they can be quite uh, similar. Because um, the asymmetry of the spring, the hardening is not easy to reach, the hardening region, but the sobling region is relatively easier to reach. So our device shows the uh, spring softening response, frequency response. And for the, all this jumping point, the simulation and experiments are pretty close. Okay, so that's the first part of our electrostatic energy conversion device. Later, we will continue to our second part of the electrostatic energy conversion.